My father's betrayal shattered the image I had of him torn between confronting the truth and preserving my family. I ran but now I'm left wondering if I made the right choice. Or if it's too late to fix what's broken. My name is Daniel. At 29, living in a bustling metropolitan area just an hour's drive from where I was raised, I find myself in a juxtaposition of worlds. My high-paced urban life as a successful software developer contrasts sharply with the quiet suburban life of my family. Earning $200,000 a year, I've established a comfortable existence in the city, complete with a sleek apartment over looking the skyline, a wardrobe suited for tech company Cheek, and a social circle that revolves around tech meetups, weekend hiking trips, and the occasional high-end restaurant outing. Yet despite this seemingly ideal setup, my thoughts frequently drift back to the single-story house nestled in the serene suburbs, the place I still call home. The house, with its fading red brick facade and the large oak tree my father planted the year I was born, cradles more than just memories. It embodies the ongoing story of my family. My mother Jane, at 64, still powers through her work week dedicating over 60 hours to her managerial role at a local logistics company. Despite the toll it takes, she brings home $95,000 annually, a sum that barely stretches to cover the essentials and the medical bills that have begun to pile up. Her resilience, often silent and unacknowledged, has been the cornerstone of our family's survival. Living with her are my father, Michael, and my older sister, Sarah, along with her spirited 4.5-year-old son, Ethan Dad, age 73, retired a few years back. His days of working as an electrician are behind him replaced now by afternoons on the porch with a crossword puzzle. The remnants of a life spent in labor quietly fading into the routine of a man sustained by social security checks. His recent health scares, multiple heart surgeries aimed at preventing strokes, have marked him with a fragility that is both new and deeply disconcerting. Sarah, having never quite recovered from a tumultuous divorce, teaches at a local preschool. Earning just $60 an hour, she relies heavily on our parents for support. The echoes of her laughter, once the soundtrack of our childhood, now seem muffled by the weight of single motherhood and financial strain. Ethan's youthful energy brings a much-needed brightness to the house, his innocence a stark contrast to the complexities of the adult lives around him. Growing up the warmth of family was the foundation of my world. My parents, though never well off, ensured that my sister and I lacked for nothing essential. They poured their energies into nurturing our interests, mine in computers and hers in art, fueling our dreams with the kind of unwavering support only parents can provide. This backdrop of familial love and sacrifice has shaped my understanding of responsibility and gratitude. Even as a teenager, I understood that the financial planning my parents had managed wouldn't suffice for their retirement. The inevitability of my my role as their future financial backbone became apparent early on. It was a silent promise I made to myself, standing in our modest backyard, looking up at the stars, a promise to give back to the two people who had given me everything. My life now filled with coding sprints and software launches is worlds away from the simplicity of suburban rhythms. Yet the success I've found in the city isn't just mine, it belongs to my family too. Each achievement, each milestone reached, is a testament to the sacrifices made in that small house. This connection pulls me back, time and again, to where it all began. The phone calls began to increase about six months ago. Mom's voice, usually steady and calm, carried a tremor of worry as she updated me on Dad's health. The surgeries, the complications, and the haunting diagnosis of microvascular dementia and cerebrovascular disease that followed. Each call etched a deeper line of concern into my daily life, a stark reminder of the ephemeral nature of time and health. It was during one such call, as I gazed out over the city lights from my apartment, that the decision was made. The pull of my family's needs outweighed the allure of city lights and fleeting tech trends. I knew then with a certainty that rooted itself deep within me. I needed to return home, to be there in ways that phone calls and weekend visits simply couldn't cover. So I started to plan. Plan for a future that involved more than just my personal aspirations, plans that would weave the safety and well-being of my family into the fabric of my daily existence. This wasn't just a decision born out of duty, but out of a deep-seated love and a commitment to those who had shaped me. This return home isn't merely a change of address, it's a reorientation of my life's priorities. As I pack up my city life, each item I place into a box, a book, a photo, a souvenir from a tech conference is a tangible reminder of the journey I've undertaken. Ahead lies a path filled with challenges and adjustments, but also with the opportunity to give back in the most meaningful way possible. As I maneuvered my sedan into the familiar driveway of my childhood home, the crunch of gravel under tires felt like a metaphor for the uneasy reintroduction to a life I once knew. Stepping out I was greeted by the sight of my mother, Jane, at the front door. Her smile was warm but worn, the kind that spoke of countless worries weathered over years. She wrapped me in an embrace that felt both comforting and desperate, her way of saying she needed help without uttering a word. Inside, the atmosphere of the house was thick with the scent of nostalgia mixed with tension. My sister Sarah stood in the kitchen, a half-smile playing on her lips as she juggled making dinner and entertaining Ethan, who buzzed around with the boundless energy of childhood. Our greetings were brief, a stilted exchange that belied the deeper currents of concern we all felt but didn't voice. Sarah was visibly thinner than I remembered. 
her face drawn not just from the fatigue of single motherhood, but from the constant strain of living in a house clouded with uncertainty. The first few days were an adjustment, a recalibration of roles within our family dynamics. My mother continued to work, her hours unyielding despite the added emotional load. At night, we sat at the dinner table, conversations skirting around the unspoken, dad's condition, the financial strain, the future. It was during these meals that I truly understood the full extent of what had been kept from me in our phone calls, the weight of dad's medical expenses, the fear of what was to come, and the everyday challenges of caring for someone who was slowly forgetting the life he had led. Dad's interactions with us had changed profoundly. Once a lively storyteller, his conversations now lost their thread, his frustrations palpable as he grappled with the gaps in his memory. Observing him, I saw flashes of the man who taught me to ride a bike, who fixed broken appliances with a magician's ease, now struggling to remember names, faces, and dates. The impact on mom was heartbreaking. She oscillated between being a caring spouse and a weary nurse, her face etching deeper with lines of sorrow each day. Sarah's reaction to my return was mixed. Initially, there was relief, an extra pair of hands to help, a reprieve from her role as the primary support. But as days passed, old grievances surfaced. We clashed not just over small mundane things like household chores or schedules, but about deeper issues. Resentments about past decisions, particularly my choice to move away and pursue my career, came to light. You left just when things were getting tough, she accused one evening, her words slicing through the fragile piece. And now you just waltz back and expecting to fix everything. These confrontations were painful but necessary. They opened up dialogues long overdue about our roles in this family, about support and sacrifice. It was through these difficult conversations that we began to navigate our new reality. Slowly, we started to forge a path forward, not just as individuals living under one roof, but as a cohesive unit facing a crisis together. Through it all, my bond with Ethan became a source of joy and escape. His innocence and unbridled enthusiasm for life reminded us all of the simpler joys. In his world, the problems were as solvable as figuring out the right block to fit into a puzzle. He became my little shadow, following me around, asking questions, his laughter a balm on the rough days. As weeks turned into months, my role in the family began to solidify. I found myself balancing my work remotely with attending doctor's appointments with dad, discussing financial strategies with mom, and providing moral support to Sarah the shift was palpable. Where once I was just a visitor in their lives, I now became an integral part of the household's daily rhythm. One evening, as mom and I sat on the porch watching the sun dip below the horizon, she turned to me, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. I'm so glad you're here, she whispered. It's been hard, harder than I ever let on, but having you here makes it feel like we can manage this, like we're not alone in it. Her words struck a chord. I realized then that my return was not just about providing financial or physical support. It was about healing, about mending the frayed threads of our family fabric. It was about showing up, not just in times of crisis but every day, proving through actions that family, with all its imperfections and challenges, is worth every sacrifice. The transition back home wasn't smooth. It was fraught with adjustments, misunderstandings, and at times heartache. But it was also filled with moments of profound connection, understanding, and gradual healing. In this house, with these people, I rediscovered the essence of home. It wasn't just a place, but a feeling of belonging, of being needed, and most importantly, of loving and being loved unconditionally. The stability we once took for granted began to shake when my father's health declined. The man who taught me how to throw a baseball, who could fix just about anything broken, found himself battling a series of health issues that seemed to come one after the other. It started with heart problems that required immediate and intensive medical intervention. The terms TAVER, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, and CAR, transcarotid artery revascularization, became unexpectedly familiar as we navigated through the complexities of cardiac surgeries designed to prevent strokes. Despite the doctor's efforts, a stroke slipped through the cracks of medical prevention, leaving him with small vessel disease and vascular dementia. His cognitive functions began to deteriorate, a stark contrast to the sharp wit and immense knowledge he once wielded effortlessly. Making the decision to move back home wasn't easy. It required me to uproot the life I had built in the city, the late-night coding sessions, the weekend hikes, the network of ambitious tech-savvy friends. I had to step away from a promotion that was almost in reach, trading potential career advancements for family responsibilities. It was a trade I made willingly, driven by an innate sense of duty that my parents had instilled in me from a young age. Moving back to the suburban home where I grew up meant reacquainting myself with its rhythms and routines. My old room, once a shrine to teenage ambitions and dreams, now seemed smaller, the walls echoing the past. Adjusting to this life meant choir evenings, the absence of city noise replaced by the subtle sounds of a house that breathed with the light lives of its inhabitants. It meant seeing my father's empty chair at the dinner table when he had particularly bad days, and it meant stepping into the role of caretaker, a role I had never envisioned in my youthful imaginings. To aid in my father's care, I introduced technology that I hoped would bridge the gap between his needs and my ability to meet them. The AirPods Pro I bought him connected him to his favorite music and shows, 
providing comfort when the confusion of dementia clouded his mind. More significantly, I gifted him my Apple Watch Series 8, equipped with health monitoring features. This watch became a crucial tool in tracking his heart's behavior, particularly its ability to detect atrial fibrillation a condition we now watched meticulously. The transition was emotionally taxing. The joy of being close to my family again was often overshadowed by the realities of my father's condition. Each doctor's visit, each small sign of his worsening health, reminded me of why I had returned. I spent countless hours researching ways to enhance his quality of life from diet changes to cognitive exercises that might slow the progression of his dementia. That night was unusually quiet, the sort of silence that seems almost anticipatory, as if the house itself was holding its breath. After dinner, where conversation fluttered nervously around mundane topics, I found myself restless. With a mind that refused to quiet, I decided to tinker with some of the tech gadgets I'd brought for Dad, thinking perhaps I could distract myself. Dad had always been somewhat wary of technology, but he had taken a peculiar interest in the Apple Watch I gave him, fascinated by its ability to monitor his heart rate and other health metrics. It had become a routine for me to help him set it up, ensure it was charged, and sometimes reset it to make sure it was functioning optimally. That night, as I took the watch into my hands, I noticed it needed resetting. The screen was lit up with notifications, too many for Dad to have possibly managed on his own. As I navigated through the meanness to find the settings, a message notification popped up briefly before disappearing. My curiosity peaked. I ventured into the messages app. It was then I noticed the recently deleted folder had entries, something I hadn't expected Dad to know how to use. The logical part of my mind suggested there was a simple explanation. Perhaps Mom had deleted messages after borrowing his watch. But something about the late hour, the quiet of the house, and the nagging sense of unease that had settled in my stomach compelled me to open the folder. The messages I found there were not just surprising, they were shocking. The texts were not from family members or old friends, but from an unknown number, discussing arrangements and meetings with an unsettling familiarity and explicitness. Each message was more revealing than the last, discussing times, locations, and payments. The content was clear. My father had been communicating with a prostitute broker. I felt a cold wave of disbelief wash over me, followed by a sharp pang of betrayal. My father, the man who had taught me the values of honesty and integrity, was leading a secret life that was now laid bare before me. I sat there, the watch heavy in my hands, as I struggled to reconcile this image with the father I thought I knew. Driven by a need to understand the full extent of this betrayal, I logged into his brokerage account, which he had shared access with me years ago for emergencies. What I found only deepened the chasm that was opening up inside me. The account, which should have held close to $100,000, was now down to $66,000. The transaction history showed several withdrawals of $3,000 each over the past year, coinciding with the dates mentioned in the deleted texts. The room felt like it was spinning as I pieced together the implications of these withdrawals. This wasn't just a moral transgression, it was a financial betrayal that affected our entire family. The money in that account was supposed to be part of my parents' retirement fund, crucial for their care, especially given Dad's health condition. Yet it had been siphoned away to fund clandestine meetings that shattered the facade of the life we had been living. I sat alone with this information well into the night, the glow from the screen of my laptop casting shadows on the walls. The weight of what I had discovered felt overwhelming, not just in its immediate impact, but in what it meant for the future. How could I confront my father about this? What would this revelation do to my mother, who had already borne so much? And what of Sarah and Ethan, who lived under this roof innocent and unaware of the storm that was brewing? The night's revelations hung heavily in the air, tainting the familiar comfort of my old bedroom. I lay there, staring at the ceiling, grappling with a whirlwind of emotions, from anger and betrayal to an overwhelming sense of desolation. Growing up, my father was my hero. He was the one who taught me to ride a bike, to respect others, and to stand up for what I believe in. But as I grew older, I witnessed the facade humble. Behind closed doors, his relationship with my mother was fraught with tension and discord. He spent money with little regard for our family's financial stability, indulging in whims as if the act could fill the growing voids within our household. My mother, in stark contrast, was the pillar who bore the financial burdens, working tirelessly, yet never allowed herself the luxury of even the smallest indulgences. In my early twenties, the strain had become unbearable. I had issued an ultimatum to them, resolve their issues or face losing me. At the time, it seemed like a necessary threat. Looking back, it only served to deepen the divide, especially with my mother who felt caught in an impossible situation. She resented the position I put her in, yet continued to patch the seams of our family fabric in silence. The night before, as I delved deeper into my father's deceit, the years of pent-up frustration and disappointment erupted. The discovery of his communications with a prostitute broker, along with the significant withdrawals from his brokerage account, was the last straw. This wasn't just a moral failing, it was a betrayal that jeopardized our family's financial security. Sitting at the kitchen table that morning, surrounded by the remnants of my childhood and the shattered pieces of the respect I once had for my father, I felt a profound sense of alienation. I couldn't face my family. I couldn't look into my mother's eyes, knowing the additional pain this would cause her. So I made a decision. 
One that now, in the quiet solitude of my city apartment, I question with every aching part of my being. I left. Without a word of explanation, I packed a bag, the weight of each item seeming to anchor me further into a quagmire of guilt and confusion. I left a note, vague and insufficient, expressing a need for some time alone to think. As I drove back to the metropolitan bustle from which I had come, each mile widened the chasm between my family and me, both physically and emotionally. Now, sitting in the dim light of my apartment, the city sounds a dull roar in the background. I am plagued by uncertainty and remorse. The silence of the space amplifies the chaos of my thoughts. I ponder the irony of how I, who had returned home to mend and care, had fled when the reality of my family's imperfections became too stark to bear. I'm struggling with the dichotomy of my emotions. On one hand, my father's actions are indefensible, a reckless endangerment of our family's stability and my mother's sacrifices. On the other, he is still my father, the man who, despite his flaws, played a crucial role in who I am today. How do I reconcile these two sides? How do I balance the scales of justice and filial duty? I remember my mother's words from years ago after I had issued my ultimatum. She had said, We all have our demons and disappointments, but we don't have to carry them alone. Her words echo in my mind now, a reminder that perhaps abandonment isn't the solution but a continuation of a cycle of hurt. I find myself typing out my thoughts, casting them into the void of the internet. Perhaps someone out there has faced similar crossroads, has navigated the murky waters of familial obligation and personal integrity. I seek not absolution, but perspective. How do others deal with the complexities of family dynamics where love and disappointment are so often intertwined? As I sit here, the cursor blinking expectantly, I realize that my journey back home isn't just about geographical distance. It's about bridging the gap between the son I was and the man I need to become. It's about facing the hard truths, not just about my father but about myself and my own reactions. It's about understanding that in the tapestry of family each thread, however flawed, contributes to the strength and pattern of the whole. Tomorrow I will call my mother. I will not offer excuses for my abrupt departure, but I will listen. I will try to understand her side of this lifelong partnership that has borne so much strain. And perhaps through these conversations we can begin to forge a new path forward not just for her and me but for our entire family. For now, I sit alone with my thoughts the city outside unaware of the turmoil within. But I am resolved not to let this night pass without reaching out, without trying to mend what has been broken. For in the end, family is not just about the good times shared, but also about navigating the storms together and emerging perhaps a little battered but whole. I find myself in a situation where I desperately need some guidance, and I hope you can offer me your opinions and possible solutions. After uncovering some troubling secrets about my father's actions which have jeopardized our family's financial stability and emotional well-being, I'm torn about how to best handle the situation. I left home abruptly, driven by a mix of anger, disappointment, and confusion, and now, sitting alone in my apartment, I'm struggling to find the right course of action. This discovery has not only caused a rift in my family but has also left me questioning my own decisions, especially my immediate reaction to flee. The dynamics in my family have always been complicated, shaped by long-standing financial strains and personal grievances, and this latest revelation feels like a breaking point. I am reaching out to you, the community, in hopes of gaining some perspective on how others might navigate such a family crisis. How do you balance personal integrity with familial responsibilities, especially when faced with deep-seated issues like betrayal? How can I approach this situation in a way that might help mend the relationships rather than cause further damage? Your insights and advice would be invaluable to me during this difficult time, and I truly appreciate any thoughts you share. Thank you for taking the time to listen about my situation and for any guidance you can provide.